Chapter 33, The Speck Snyder. Concerning the officers of the whale craft, this seems as good a place as any to set down a little domestic peculiarity on shipboard, arising from the existence of the harpooner class of officers, a class unknown, of course, in any other marine than the whale fleet. The large importance attached to the harpooner's vocation is evinced by the fact that originally in the old Dutch fishery two centuries and more ago, the command of a whale ship was not wholly lodged in the person now called the captain, but was divided between him and an officer called the specksnider. Literally, this word means fat cutter. Usage, however, in time made it equivalent to chief harpooner. In those days, the captain's authority was restricted to the navigation and general management of the vessel. While over the whale hunting department and all its concerns, the specksnider or chief harpooner reigned supreme. In the British Greenland fishery under the corrupted title of specksioneer, the old Dutch official is still retained, but his former dignity is sadly abridged. At present, he ranks simply as senior harpooner, and as such is but one of the captain's more inferior subalterns. Nevertheless, as upon the good conduct of the harpooners, the success of a whaling voyage largely depends, and since in the American fishery he is not only an important officer in the boat, but under certain circumstances, night watches on a whaling ground, the command of the ship's deck is also his. Therefore, the grand political maxim of the sea demands that he should nominally live apart from the men before the mast, and be in some way distinguished as their professional superior, though always by them, familiarly regarded as their social equal. Now the grand distinction drawn between officer and man at sea is this, the first lives aft, the last forward. Hence in whale ships and merchantmen alike, the mates have their quarters with the captain. And so too, in most of the American whalers, the harpooners are lodged in the after part of the ship. That is to say, they take their meals in the captain's cabin and sleep in a place indirectly communicating with it. Though the long period of the southern whaling voyage, by far the longest of all voyages now or ever made by man, the peculiar perils of it and the community of interest prevailing among a company, all of whom, high or low, depend for their profits not upon fixed wages, but upon their common luck, together with their common vigilance, intrepidity, and hard work. Though all these things do in some way cases tend to beget a less rigorous discipline than in merchant men generally. Yet, never mind how much like an old Mesopotamian family these whalemen may, in some primitive instances, live together. For all that, the punctilious externals, at least, of the quarter deck are seldom materially relaxed, and in no instance done away. Indeed, many are the Nantucket ships in which you will see the skipper parading his quarter deck with an elated grandeur not surpassed in any military navy, nay, extorting almost as much outward homage as if he were the imperial purple and not the shabbiest of pilot cloth. And though of all men, the moody captain of the Pequod was the least given to that sort of shallowest assumption. And though the only homage he ever exacted was implicit instantaneous obedience. Though he required no man to remove the shoes from his feet ere stepping upon the quarter deck. And though there were times when, owing to peculiar circumstances connected with events hereafter to be detailed, he addressed them in unusual terms, whether of condescension or in terrarum or otherwise. Yet even Captain Ahab was by no means unobservant of the paramount forms and usages of the sea. Nor perhaps will it fail to be eventually perceived that behind those forms and usages, as it were, he sometimes masked himself, incidentally making use of them for other and more private ends than they were legitimately intended to subserve. That certain sultanism of his brain, which had otherwise in a good degree remained unmanifested, through those forms that same sultanism became incarnate in an irresistible dictatorship. For be a man's intellectual superiority what it will, it can never assume the practical available supremacy over other men without the aid of some sort of external arts and entrenchments, always in themselves more or less paltry and base. This it is that forever keeps God's true princes of the empire from the world's hustings and leaves the highest honors that the heir can give to those men who become famous more through their infinite inferiority to the choice hidden handful of the divine inert 
than through their undoubted superiority over the dead level of the mass. Such large virtue lurks in these small things when extreme political superstitions invest them that in some royal instances, even to idiot imbecility, they have imparted potency. But when, as in the case of Nicholas the Tsar, the ringed crown of geographical empire encircles an imperial brain, then the plebeian herds crouch abased before the tremendous centralization. Nor will the tragic dramatist who would depict mortal indomitableness in its fullest sweep and direct swing ever forget a hint, incidentally so important in its art as the one now alluded to. But Ahab, my captain, still moves before me in all his Nantucket grimness and shagginess. And in this episode touching emperors and kings, I must not conceal that I have only to do with a poor old whale hunter like him. And therefore, all outward majestical trappings and housings are denied me. O oh, Ahab, what shall be grand in thee, it must needs be plucked at from the skies and dived for in the deep and featured in the unbodied air.